I discovered Reason when I was in my early 20s. It was great. Even though at first glance it did look a bit daunting, a hellscape of never-ending incomprehensible controls. Man, I've, I've no idea what I'm looking at. What, what is all this stuff? Ah! But it's actually really intuitive. You drag audio units into a virtual rack, you wire them together, and hey presto, you now have the ability to construct incredibly powerful synthesizers from the ground up. However, in the mid-2000s, due to increasing competition, technical growing pains, and some notably absent features, Reason began to feel a little inferior. And noticing this, Propellerhead realised they needed to make some dangerous design decisions in order to get Reason to be the all-singing, all-dancing workstation that everyone wanted it to be. And in this video, we're going to look at that journey because it offers us a masterclass in design decision-making, from high-level strategic decisions down to the minute detail of how the interface face of reason looks and feels. And this is the first in a series that will touch on different audio applications from a musical and design perspective. And I'll talk a little more about what's next at the end. In 2005, I moved to London to study music composition and funded myself by working as a software designer. And from these two perspectives, I began to look at Reason in a very different way. As a composer, I wanted it to be a full-blown digital audio workstation, or DAW for short, with audio recording and professional mixing. But as a designer, I recognised that this wasn't a simple thing to just go and do. To grant this request, some very difficult design challenges needed to be overcome, and we're going to look at those through a very specific lens, something that's rarely discussed in software design that I think needs to be called out more often design idealism. This is a blanket term I'm using for the practice of strictly adhering to self-imposed design rules. The ideal is that by choosing a perfect vision, you can get close to achieving a perfect application, something immensely satisfying that requires zero learning curve to use. And even though we all know perfection isn't possible, it makes sense to try and achieve it, which is why when companies are faced with unexpected roadblocks, there's often an instinctive emotional reluctance to deviate from the established vision. Because if perfection is no longer our goal, then surely we're moving in the wrong direction, right? And when I say design rules, I'm referring to everything. High-level strategic decisions, like defining your target audience. Company mantras stating broad principles like we do it differently, or democratizing XYZ for everyone. Then there are mid-level design rules that state how your software is generally arranged, all the way down to tiny visual rules dictating things like the precise amount of pixels between controls. And you can add into the mix a range of external design trends and best practices, which can also be very influential. Now all of these things serve a practical purpose, helping to set a common vision for designers, CEOs, and investors alike, while avoiding the organizational chaos that can occur when people go off and do their own thing. And as you probably guessed, this video is about the difficult moments where you need to break these rules, where you should be non-ideological. Simple in theory, but often pretty difficult in practice. So let's start with a simple, small-scale example of a general trend. If you work in design, you've most likely come across click counting, the practice of setting a limit on the number of clicks, or presses, it takes to get from one place to another. The phrase, no more than three clicks away, is pretty common in the world of design, and although the intention is good, it nearly always results in upfront clutter like this. W w wow, what am I looking at here? Oh, there's, there's options for my options. Home, my page, menu. Ah! For websites like Amazon, this type of principle makes a lot of sense, but in other cases, it doesn't. So let's now apply it to something generally regarded as being well designed, the iPhone menu. We'd get in trouble pretty quickly if we wanted to change, say, accessibility settings. One, two, three, uh-oh, three click rule says this isn't good design. We need all those options in one gargantuan scrolling list. I hope your accessibility issue wasn't carpal tunnel syndrome. The Start getting the tingling or the pain. Yep. Another ideal designers worry about on a daily basis is consistency. Obviously, if an app behaves in a consistent way, it's going to be pretty easy for people to navigate it without getting confused. Imagine you were making a website that used the color red to mean no and green to mean yes. Then it would be a pretty big mistake if your credit card details page was styled like this. However, at the structural level, the topic of consistency gets a bit more complicated. Back to my earlier example of wanting to find things quickly on the iPhone. Apple eventually realised that their menu was slightly clunky when it came to common tasks like turning on and off Wi-Fi. And because they didn't want to break with the perfectly good system they'd already built, they instead took a lesson from Android and Ubuntu Mobile by introducing the control centre with iOS 7. A necessary halfway house that broke with both the look and logic of the rest of the system. Usability before consistency. Good Apple. You get one point for that. And with this in mind, we can now start talking about the massive design problems Propellerhead faced. By the time we got to Reason 5, it had two major consistency rules. First, anything that produced sound was represented as a physical piece of hardware. This real-world representation made it easy to get how Reason worked. 
But this came with limitations. Mimicking the real world in this way requires that you observe the rules of physics, especially the idea that everything has to be wired up in order to work. So if I wanted to do something complex, like send an audio signal to multiple different places, I'd have to first send it to this thing, a unique device that splits the signal, giving me multiple outputs, each of which I then have to wire to the intended device manually. Programs like Logic Pro use a more abstract system, where you can send an audio signal to a different place by selecting it from a disconnected dropdown. The link between elements is implied, more in line with other music creation apps. And although this is faster, it's not necessarily better. Apps that rely too much on abstract connections can be difficult to learn, which can dissuade first-time users from ever coming back. So even though Reason's literal system was sometimes clunky, it was easy to understand, and also kind of fun too. The other major consistency rule of Reason was that all sound had to be triggered by MIDI, either written in manually or recorded externally on a keyboard. If you wanted to use pre-recorded audio of any kind, you had to import it into a sampler and then trigger it using a MIDI signal. You couldn't just record audio directly in, because that wasn't really what it was originally intended for. But due to these limitations, Reason was really streamlined. Everything worked the same way. However, on the other hand, programs like Cubase, Logic Pro, and FL Studio were introducing features that directly competed with Reason. They began to look like the better overall choice, great synths, and the ability to record and mix live audio. And there was definitely a point around 2005 where Reason looked in danger of becoming obsolete. So recognizing this, Propellerhead began planning to offer audio recording and proper mixing. And here's where they came up against the massive design challenge. In order to offer any of this stuff, they needed to break not one, but both of their core consistency rules. Let me explain. Up to Reason version 5, you first created your instrument and then you hooked it up to a main mixer at the top of the rack. If you didn't do this, you didn't hear anything. And since each mixer contained only 14 channels, you often needed to awkwardly chain multiple mixers together to get more than that. And this is why audio recording posed such a large structural problem. Imagine how bad it would be if every time you wanted to record a new take, you had to manually wire the channel to a mixer. It would never fly. Audio recording needed to be automatic and you needed a lot more channels too. And so Propellerhead took the brave decision to allow multiple inconsistencies. First, they introduced a virtual mixer that lived outside the rack and which had no visible connection to the devices. This meant that when you wanted to create a new audio track, it was represented by this piece of imaginary hardware, which just popped into existence. It wasn't wired in any visible way, you just had to learn that for every one of these you had in your rack, a channel existed for it somewhere in your mixer. And by allowing audio to be recorded and played back independent of MIDI, a whole bunch of new interface controls were needed, which took away from the app's simplicity. This can't have been an easy decision for Propellerhead, breaking with the traditions that put it on the map, and I'd love to know how many arguments it caused in the design studio. But I think it was the right decision. Rather than sticking with an ideal, they risked complicating their existing system and forged ahead, making sure that everything new they created was as fun and reason-like as possible. The result is an app that's infinitely better than before, albeit with a slightly higher learning curve. So now, let's take a look at Reason from a slightly different point of view. One of the problems of interface design is that things go in and out of fashion relatively quickly, and when journalists write about specific examples of bad practice, say in web design, it can gain traction, often influencing designers working on something completely different, like a game or operating system. For example, I can't count the amount of times I've seen mobile app controls ending up on the desktop. Oh look, Pitchfork have this hamburger menu now. Uh, my whole screen is taken over, so I can see the same options I already have here. Uh, have you ever heard of a rollover menu? Oh, Pitchfork, the best place to go for all the latest showbiz goss. Ariana Grande taps Nicki Minaj for new song, The Light Is Coming, colon, listen. Cool! Oh look, Pharrell, that's three names I know! Let's look at an article that came out last year titled Why Are There So Many Knobs in GarageBand? which criticizes a variety of music creation apps for their heavy use of something called skeuomorphism. For those who don't know, skeuomorphism is a tedious design buzzword that refers to the practice of basing interactive elements on real physical objects, like a slider mimics the way a uh, slider works, or I know there's another example, um, pretty common, what are they called again? Oh yeah, buttons! <clears throat> And one thing to note about skeuomorphic design is that just because it works like the real thing doesn't mean it has to look like the real thing. Case in point, the older versions of Apple's iOS. For some reason, the iPhone just keeps popping into this video. Back then, iBooks used to look like an actual bookshelf until a few versions later when Apple finally realized that it was pointless and awful looking. And due to the large amount of commentary on this topic, skeuomorphism became a bit of a dirty word. Bad Apple, that's minus one point for you. So let's scroll down through the article, past some admittedly bizarre looking plugins. I mean, what the hell is this? Like a criminally terrible use of space. And oh look, 
a little section on Reason. A digital audio workstation designed to mimic the flexibility of a studio rack full of analogue equipment. Unfortunately, it also mimics the look of such a rack. And, and why is that bad? Oh, that's it. It's bad because skeuomorphism is bad. End of critique. I guess it's just lost on the author that one of the advantages of designing an interface in this way is that it helps complicated things to be separated out into visually distinguishable parts, or that the mimicking of real-world analogue devices is very useful for young musicians because it actually teaches them about how these things work in real life. But hold on, there's more insight to be had. It also features circular rotating knobs, surely the most pervasive slash least useful UI element in this type of software. What? Okay, let's put that statement to the test. So in most music software, knobs work like this. You click and drag downwards or upwards to change the value, and most commonly if you hold shift, then the control is much finer so you can hit precise values. In other apps like After Effects or Premiere, you can drag on these text values in exactly the same way. This is about as efficient as it gets, and knobs are just a different looking version of the same thing. But you might rightly ask, can't we just show text values instead of knobs then if they're the same thing? Well, let's take a look. Here's a synth in Reason that has lots of knobs, so let's replace them with text values then. Hmm. Okay, so first off, unlike knobs, I have no idea of what the maximum or minimum of any of these values are, meaning I've lost information. And I can no longer quickly glance at any area to get a rough idea of how it's arranged. I have to read each value one by one to comprehend it. This is compounded by the fact that MIDI parameters often range from minus 64 to 63, meaning that I've no common baseline. Zero could mean either nothing at all or right in the middle. Not to mention if I have an external keyboard and I turn one real knob, I can no longer see its equivalent to turning in the UI. So figuring out how these things are connected is much more time consuming too. Yep, you see why they chose knobs? This is a type of criticism Reason has faced for years. One they've rightly ignored because they understand better than most the value of their own unique mechanics. I'm giving this article an E-. Congratulations, you didn't get an F. I gave you extra credit for not mentioning Hitler. And one last point about this whole skeuomorphism thing. If you think these controls look a bit lame and you'd like to see something more modern, like the Yofield synth seen here, then fine. But just don't make the mistake of assuming that because they look cheesy, that they're bad from an interaction point of view. Elements like this are only bad when they're being misused. If my dog gets sick and I choose to cure him with the spanner, and he dies, his death isn't the fault of the spanner. It's his own goddamn fault for getting sick. Anyway, the most recent improvement Propeller had made marks yet another big reversal for them, finally providing VST plugin support, something they said they'd never do in the past, so much so that when their CEO made the announcement, he started with the words, when hell freezes over. Instead of persisting with the argument that VSTs reduce stability and performance, they instead allowed us to decide on that trade-off for ourselves, and as a result gave us a massively improved range of choice, allowing me to finally use my favourite synth of all time. So before I talk about what software I'm going to be looking at next, let's give one last hurrah for Propellerhead and their practical design decision making, both small and large scale. They've had some bumps along the way, but they've always rebounded to make the right choices in the right order. Well done Propellerhead, you get a point. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd also love a point. So what's next? What other music software app can we look at that can offer us the same level of unique design insight? Oh. Oh. Oh Jesus. Jesus Christ. If you like my diatribe, subscribe.